All right. Hey, hey, everybody, let's um, let's pray and then we'll we'll jump into uh, the conversation for today. Father, we bless you. God, we glorify you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for another day of life. We thank you for um, your grace and your mercy. We also thank you for your love. We thank you, God, for enduring with us. Uh, and so, Father, we pray now in Jesus name that you would teach that you would preach that you would open our ears to hear and our eyes to see what you say and what you show to your church father we pray now in jesus name holy spirit that you would stir us and that you would encourage us that we may be better equipped to do what you're calling us to do in this day in this moment in this season uh, in our individual lives and in the life of your church so we glorify you now in jesus name we pray amen uh today you guys i am uh <laughs> it's just one of those days i had uh, one thing that went stupidly long and so uh i'm doing this with you all from a car um uh, because i would not have made it to any destination in time so uh so bear with me as we are going to kind of just try our best to uh flow through what i believe uh, the lord has laid uh on my heart for you all and i heard um uh, my my mom would say Miss Breckenridge say uh guy always gives me a word for you guys uh and so that is uh humbling and encouraging um and I and I believe for today I was actually kind of relieved because I feel like the last couple of times that I've shared with you all uh the Holy Spirit has put us in places where we were dealing with like suffering and struggle <laughs> and and uh, all this stuff and it's like Lord Jesus um but today you guys i want us to consider the subject of faith the subject of faith um if you all have your bibles turn to romans 8 romans 8 uh like around verse 18 or so let me see if i can get something in here uh romans 8 and it's like verse 18 and 19 romans 8 verse 18 and 19 let's see Oh, here we go. Thank you, Lord. Romans 8. We're going to talk about faith for a little bit. Romans 8, 18 through 19. I would strongly encourage you guys, if you have pen and paper or computer or whatever you take notes with, take notes. Romans 8, verse 18 through 19. It says this, uh, Amplify says, For I consider from the standpoint of faith that the sufferings of the present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us. For even the whole creation, all of nature eager, waits eagerly for the children of God to be revealed. Paul says, for I consider, and in parentheses in the Amplified it says, from the standpoint of faith that the sufferings of the present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us. For even the whole creation, all nature waits eagerly for the children of God to be revealed. Uh, so considering faith, but we need to back up for a second to um, for you to I think get the point. I want us to consider uh, when dealing with faith, the life of Caleb, the life of Caleb, uh, Caleb, the Bible talks and we we meet Caleb, I think somewhere in Numbers. Um, and Caleb is one of the spies that goes into the land. God has set the children of Israel free from Egypt. He's about to take them to the to land flowing the milk and honey. Y'all remember the whole story. He's about to hook them up. And they get to the place, they see the promised land, and they send spies into the land to scout out the land. So they go into the land, they scout it out, they come back. And as they're given the report, we know, most of us know how that story goes. Uh, the bulk of the spies come back and say, yo, we can't, we can't do this. It's, it's too many of them. They're too big. There's giants in that land. We can't take it. But Caleb uh, says, no, we can pull this off. And the Bible actually specifically says, God says, Caleb had another spirit. Caleb had another spirit. That Caleb was different. Uh, there's something in Caleb uh saw things differently than the other saw right and god then at that moment prophesies of sorts promises caleb something he says to caleb that he will see the land he tells the rest of them y'all ain't gonna see it 
Caleb, you get this particular part of this promise, right? And so when you get to Joshua, uh, I think it's Joshua 14, uh, you get to this point and they they at the precipice, they they at the edge of the promise, right? Caleb goes up to Joshua and like, yo, 40 years ago, God made me a promise. He told me that this, this piece would be mine. And he says, so now therefore give me this mountain for I'm as strong today. Uh, to war, to go out to battle as I was in that day. And so he gets uh, Joshua and reminds Joshua of what God has said to him, what God has prophesied, what God has promised him. And the interesting thing here, you guys, though, and you heard me reference this before in other conversations, is that uh, he's reminding Joshua that this particular area, this particular uh, land is mine, this mountain is mine. But the mountain, the land is still inhabited by giants. And so that's why Caleb makes the point to say, I am as strong today as I was then to war and to battle. And so he now, even though this has been promised to him, even though it's been prophesied to him, he still now has to fight for what is spiritually his, naturally as well, but it's about to naturally become his because it's already been declared spiritually, all right? The question for me becomes when you look at Caleb's life, what was different about Caleb from jump, from the start, for God to say there was a different spirit about him? And what was that thing in him that he could go into the same place, see the same thing everybody else saw, encounter the same thing everybody else encountered, stand in the middle of the same circumstance, the same situation. Nothing is different between Caleb and the other spies in a natural sense. They're all in the same predicament. But yet he walks away with a totally different view of what to expect. He walks away with a totally different idea of what can be achieved and accomplished. I would suggest to you all that the thing that was different to him is the very thing that kept him through the 40 years and is the very thing that gave him the strength and the ability to still be able to go in and battle. Imagine, God tells you something is yours. 40 years later, you stand finally on the edge of that, okay? Now, the first thing I want you guys to understand, I'm gonna kind of go through it quickly, so I would encourage you to uh, watch it again um, because I think the Holy Spirit will keep revealing stuff to you. The first thing I want to say to many of you is you, you have to, you must, you absolutely have to uh, take age out of the equation. You have to take age out of the equation. Um, and I know for some of you, that's going to hit home in a different way because you're 50, 60, 70, maybe. Um, you have to take age out of the equation. God is eternal. God does not operate. He is not confined to time. And so the first thing you, I want you to do is take age out of the equation. So it does not matter how long it's been since God promised. It does not matter how long it's been since God spoke, prophesied something to you. Uh, today, prophecy is all the rage. Everybody want to profit. Everybody want to be prophesied to. It does not matter when this is spoken. Time and age have to be removed from this equation. It's 40 years later, and you stand at the brink of your promise. And this is a crazy thing. 40 years, I wait only to still have to fight. So I got to wait, then I have to fight to occupy what has been called to me, what has been deemed mine, what has been said by God that this is yours, right? I believe you guys, what is different in Caleb is his faith, Caleb's faith. Caleb's faith made him different. Um, his, his difference and his different spirit, I would also say, inform his faith. And so it is It is already ingrained in him, an insane, and I say insane on purpose, an insane level of belief in God's word, okay? The first thing I want to say is write this down. Those of you taking notes, write this down. Uh, every promise or prophecy, uh, I'll, I'll use them interchangeable for now. Every promise, every prophecy is an invitation 
to warfare. It's an invitation to warfare. It is an invitation to fight. Every word you get from God is an invitation to fight for that word. We, we've become so domesticated in the church today. Um, and I don't know if this started in the last 10 years. I don't know if this started 20 years. I don't know when it started. But where we just want to receive word, get word, give me a word, give me a word, give me a word. And think that just because we received a word, that automatically that means bingo, bam, it's going to show, it's it's going to happen. Um, uh, prosperity gospel was notorious for this foolishness. And so we, we have to understand that a word from God is going to be an invitation to step into a place where we begin to battle and war for that word, okay? How do you fight for a word? How do you fight for what is prophesied? Why do I even have to fight for a promise? Why would I have to fight for something God has declared to me? Because God declares things from the heavens. God declares things from eternity. Uh, we lost authority to the enemy when Adam and Eve sinned. Right. As the church, as the body of believers, we individually and collectively as one body have authority over the enemy. But the enemy still has authority in this realm. He still controls the earth realm. And God does not intervene unless his sons and daughters grant permission through our free will and invite him into the space that his will be done on earth. That means anytime God's will wants to manifest in the earth realm, he has to partner with man because he's decided to do this. But in partnering with us, we are still in a realm in which even though we have authority over the enemy, the enemy has rulership over the place that we're in, which means anytime we begin to initiate God's will in the earth, the enemy is going to fight it. So God can declare a thing and we could begin to say, yes, God, I want that. We yield to it. Uh, but immediately the enemy is going to fight it. Jesus, loosely, I will connect it in this sense, when Jesus talks about the sower and the seed falling, when the seed falls, it falls among the thorns, seed falls, it falls, and uh, the, the crows or whatever, the birds snatch it away. It, it, the seed is vulnerable until it manifests what it's supposed to be, right? Good soil, hear me, y'all. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Good soil is the protection and the covering of a word well received. What is that soil? That soil is not the rain. The rain and the waters are not controlled by the farmer. The rain and the waters are controlled by God. So even a seed, even though God may speak something, there are things that only God controls that determines how that seed manifests. But what do we control? We control the soil. And the soil, you all, is where our faith is put into action. It is where our faith is covering the very thing God has spoken. Uh, so when you jump back to Romans, the text in Romans makes me think of Caleb. Because Paul is saying, I, I reckon, I conclude, I, um, I understand that the sufferings of the present life are not worthy. They can't be compared to the glory that is about to come to us. Uh, the word reckon, the word reckon um, means to uh, like take inventory, to uh, establish or determine by, by calculation, right? So when Paul says, I reckon, he, he's basically saying, I take inventory. I, I am standing in the storeroom of, of my existence. And as I'm counting and taking inventory of everything around me, I have counted and concluded that what's in front of me suggests that there is a greater glory, that there's something greater coming, right? And I love the Amplify because the Amplify puts in the parentheses, it says from the standpoint of faith. Because if you are not counting if you are not uh, taking inventory from the standpoint of faith, then we are left with our natural uh, senses. So as human beings in the flesh, our natural senses, we, we see with our eyes, we hear with our ears, we taste by the tongue, we feel by the flesh, right? So every sense, how we take stock, how we take inventory of anything around us is through the flesh. Um, 
to to take inventory of what do I wear when I go outside. The skin takes inventory of that. It is the skin's gonna tell you, hey yo, it's 16 degrees, so we need to we need to do something different. Uh, the skin tells you, oh no, it's it's 60 degrees, so we need to do something different. And so that is how we take an in inventory, right? What the enemy loves most is he desires for us to only take inventory through the flesh. When we only take it through the flesh, we only pull in the things that are natural. We only can take in the things that are fleshly. We can only take in the things that are carnal. And this is not just mean in like some negative or demonic sense. Uh, good music, Luther Vandross make good music, but it's carnal. <laughs> uh, Stevie Wonder make good music, but it's carnal. Um, you can watch the news for information to be informed, uh, uh, and it may not even be bad news, but it's still carnal, right? And so anything we take in in that space becomes carnal. It becomes fleshly because that's the only way for, it to take, for us to take in inventory through the natural man, right? This is one of the reasons I encourage you guys, and you hear me say it sometimes, but and it's not to beat a dead horse, but it's really to really, really encourage you to consider what you watch, what you listen to, what you take in, and not in some weird legalistic way where, you know, you just aren't doing anything. And I think that's one of the blessings of the fast that you're currently on from media and different things, because that is constantly giving you inventories, is you constantly taking stock. And so if you're only watching uh, the news all the time, if you're only listening to certain music all the time, if you're only watching certain movies, whatever the case, that that is how you begin to take inventory, right? And once you begin to take that inventory, if the inventory is fully taken in the flesh, then you can only calculate based upon what is tangible, right? You can only make a calculation and you can only make a decision and a determination based upon what you feel. You can only make a determination based upon what you see. You can only make a determination based upon what you have heard and what you have felt, okay? And so when the bulk of what we feel, see, taste, hear, touch is not spiritual and it is not the word of God, then that means the inventory and the stock that we take will always be more rooted in the flesh and in nature and in, in the world around us and the things that we're ex experiencing. And so you will begin to see suffering strictly through the lens of how it impacts your senses. I'm saying, uh, you will begin to see suffering strictly through the lens of how it impacts your senses. I believe you all, this is one of the reasons that the other spies go into the land now, this is crazy. They're sent into a land, the God says it's flowing with milk and honey, but they come out terrified because the only thing that overwhelmed their senses, or let me say it this way, the fear of the giants overwhelmed their natural senses more than the sight of the milk and honey. Because they're only taking stock through their physical senses. That's, that, that's all they got, right? And so you begin to see suffering through that lens alone. That, that's why many struggle and many struggled so greatly with the pandemic is because we raised a church that had no spiritual depth to how they discern suffering. We could only discern suffering through what was tangible. And the reason for this is because we taught you all that faith gave you tangible feel goods. That faith got you a husband, that faith got you a wife, that faith got you a house, that faith would get you a car, that faith would get you money, that faith would heal your body. And so because of this, what are all those things? All those things feel good to the flesh. And so therefore, we began to equate faith and strictly begin to count faith through what we feel, what we taste, what we see, what we sense, and, and how it makes us move and how life is going, right? So when calamity hits, when suffering hits, when you enter, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, a land that is actually flowing with milk and honey, you only see giants. You only see giants. And so Paul um, is saying, I conclude that the present suffering, 
can't be compared. It's, it's, it's not it's not the same. <laughs> and Paul, you sound kind of crazy a little bit. You sound crazy a little bit because Paul has to be talking from the standpoint of faith because you're talking about something that is now with something that ain't. How do you compare what you have with what you don't? It, that's like me saying, uh, I reckon that my uh, Ford Mustang is not worthy to be compared to my Ferrari. I don't have no Ferrari. I can't, I can't, I can't sit them side by side. So how am I comparing the two? All I got is the Mustang. All I have, Paul, is the suffering. What are you comparing this stuff to? Now, when Paul talks about sufferings, and I'm gonna go through it super quick. In this particular case, it's very general, right? Um, prior to this, he's speaking kind of specifically about uh, suffering for the sake of the kingdom, suffering for missional sake, like you know, doing the work of the Lord and the enemy attacks. He's talking about general suffering right here, right? Um, that's when he talks about when he says all the creation groans, all the creation um, waits because creation is suffering. So you have uh, creational suffering that is a result of the fall. You have uh, suffering from grief, losing somebody. You have suffering from when we're a victim and meaning we're suffering at the hands of somebody else. Somebody else did something to us. You have collective suffering where one group of people in particular suffers different than another group of people. Uh, you have discipline, co corrective suffering when when God corrects us and puts us through some stuff. We have uh, suffering from the enemy, opposition, oppositional suffering. So the enemy is attacking, you know, um, and then they're suffering just for the sake of doing ministry and, sh and struggle. Right. So this is a collective thing he's talking about. It, it is a broad spectrum of suffering. It's the same suffering that is in uh, Philippians. Um, let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it real quick because I want y'all to uh, did not expect that other thing to go so long. I had my stuff. I'm sorry. Let me see. Uh, oh, here. Philippians chapter 3, 9. It says this, and and may be found in him, not having any righteousness of my own derived from the law and its rituals, but that which comes through faith in Christ. This is Philippians chapter three, nine and 10. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Verse 10, and this, so that I may know him, that I may know him. Uh, oh my goodness and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings by being continually conformed to him even to his death sufferings that sufferings that sufferings now this is the crazy thing it's broad right it's a broad use of the word sufferings but we also see it here in the same sense that jesus suffered so it's not different it is an experience it is something we go through all shall suffer but then paul says uh this present sufferings i i reckon that these present sufferings these now sufferings now this is interesting this is very interesting the word present and some it's a different word in each translation but it means in the greek it is the word kairos is the word kairos, which for some of you, that may not mean anything. But when, when the Greek uh, broke between the words, the word time broke it up, there is chronos and there's kairos. Chronos, when referring to a time, any time, chronos is calendar stuff. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You remember the song? Uh, <laughs> Saturday. Uh, it, it's, it's calendar, right? Chronos is calendar. Chronos is nine o'clock, ten o'clock, twelve o'clock. It's 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 ordered time. It, it goes in order. It's linear on a on a calendar, right? Kairos is not calendar. Kairos is not a Pacific nine a.m., ten p.m. Kairos is a, is described as an opportune time, like a season. It is it is a moment, right? That is set apart. So you can have a Kairos moment at a chronos time, 
Okay. So at, it may be 10 a.m. For me, or let's say, even when, what time is it now? 12, it's 12.30 for me now. It's 2.30 for y'all. We're at different chronos, but God could be doing something in this moment, right? So God can do a kairos. You can have a kairos moment in a chronos time. Okay, y'all with me so far? All right. So when Paul talks about this, he's saying this present time, this present uh, suffering, it is kairos. And that's interesting to me. Meaning this suffering Paul refers to is not confined to a time. This is not simply a time period suffering. Uh, those of y'all that do exegete texts and pull stuff out, uh, that means we can't say, well, Paul is speaking of the fall of this and this is happening during this day. I mean, yeah, all that is happening. But the word he's giving, what he's writing here. This suffering is not confined to Paul's time period. It is a opportune suffering. Now that's what messes me. This is what messed me up. Looking at the Greek, this, this is a suffering that is set at perfect timing. It's it's at a perfect time. It's 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 it's, <laughs> it's now. It's almost like a present a present perfect tense now it, it is a it is a suffering that is always ongoing it is what in the world jesus what what do you what in the world the sufferings y'all aren't confined to a point in chronos but they are connected to a specific opportune kairos this means that sufferings are not connected to hours and days on a calendar but they are connected watch this to god's seasons in our lives. This is the same uh, season, this, this, this Kairos, the same season is used in Galatians 6, 9, when Paul says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, we will reap if we faint not. For don't get tired of what you're doing because in the opportune time, you will reap right? It's not a calendar harvest. You can't plant the seed uh, in, in whenever you plant seed. I don't know when you, because I don't farm and nothing like that, but you can't plant it and it come up without the other crop, right? It's going to come up in God's opportune time. Because you all, these sufferings are not confined uh, to one area of our life, it can seem as though they last longer than they should. Um, it could seem as though you and I are perpetually suffering. It could seem as though we are always going through. When really I would submit to you that that's not the case, that each suffering has its own expiration date. Um, uh, how can I put it? It, it, is, it is your refrigerator. Everything in your refrigerator it's in the refrigerator. It's in the same refrigerator, <laughs> but it each has a different expiration date. It does not all have the same expiration date. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Unless the power to the refrigerator goes out, Ooh, then all of it's going to go bad at the same time. Uh, uh, oh, thank you, Holy. That's a whole nother thing. I can't say that, but it can feel like, it can feel like we are perpetually in a place of suffering when really one suffering is expiring and another is starting. And then that one expires and then another one starts. And you say, well, God, why would you consistently have me going through these things? The, the issue is not, watch this. The question is, God, is not why do you keep having me in these sufferings? That's not the question. The question is, <laughs> why have I not yet realized the beauty of these sufferings. <sighs> Caleb had a different spirit. Paul says it's not worthy to be compared. You can't compare the two. You, you, can't, you, you can't compare the milk and the honey with the giants. And Caleb and them come out and they make us, you make, you know. We are grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we feel like we're grasshoppers to them because we see ourselves as grasshoppers. It is, it is the internalizing of what the flesh has read around it that causes us to begin to step into places of doubt 
that we begin, watch this, the doubt causes us to disagree with what God has said. Doubt causes us to disagree with what God has said to such a point that we lean more on what we've taken stock in through our senses than we do what God has declared. The difficult, the problem with that is it is a comparison issue because now we're comparing what God has said against what we see. We begin to place what God has declared up against time. We begin to, to, to compare what God has said and put it up against how we feel in our body. We take what God has said and we put it up against our bank account and we, compa- and we stand back and we compare the two. And because we have not learned to take inventory with something other than our fleshly senses, then the other, the fleshly part always looks greater, always looks bigger, always seems more prevalent, not because it is, but it's because that's how we're wired. Uh, it's, it's, It's because we have not yet submitted the flesh to his will to such a degree that it is broken before him. And the reason God wants the flesh broken is not because he's trying to harm us. It is because he wants us to not have that tool to misread the room. Um, we're, we're comparing now sufferings to unrevealed glory. <laughs> well, I mean, when we walk by sight and not by faith, that's never going to come out even. We're comparing y'all what we have in hand with what has not yet been delivered, what has not yet been revealed. The spies that said, now we can't do that. They're counting different inventory than Caleb. They are counting the giants. Caleb is counting God. Yeah. When you go, watch this. This is what different spirit does. Different spirit causes you to enter into the place with a different, with a different view and a different perception. They were all sent in to scout the land. The difference between the two is Caleb's going to look for the best way to take it. They're going to look for the best way to stay alive. Uh, uh, um, the Amplified says from the standpoint of faith, standpoint of faith, this, this, this is a perception issue. Uh, I'll never forget, I told my church not too long ago about an experience I had with um, KFC. And they, they didn't have chicken. <laughs> how, do you, how, you, <laughs> how you a chicken place that don't have chicken? That's a whole nother thing. And i never forget... Um, I get to the window I already paid. I'm sitting there like three hours waiting for this chicken. They finally come and the cashier tells me, hey, we're sorry, we're out of chicken. Uh, okay, um, y'all KFC, how do you not have chicken? Exactly, where they do that at? They do it a lot, apparently. Um, California is weird, that's a whole nother thing. Um, and so the manager comes to the window and he says to me, hey man, so sorry, but <laughs> here's a coupon for free chicken. You're going to give me a coupon for something you ain't got. You don't have no chicken. Why are you giving me a free coupon for chicken? And he says, well, you know, we, we, we got a truck coming in. We'll have more chicken tomorrow. Well, how does that help my hunger now? <laughs> what? Yeah, this is the thing. This, this, and this is what I want y'all to get. I now then have to believe now what he says enough to anticipate a future delivery that I can't see enough to change my plans for tomorrow to come back here to get what you could not give me today. Our struggle oftentimes with God is that God is consistently saying when he gives a word and when he declares something, we are looking at it's not in my hand now. And you're telling me it's coming. So you want me to 
alter my plans for my tomorrow to show up and wait again. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, Paul says, you can't compare the two. For the whole of creation eagerly awaits for the children of God to be revealed. There's an anxious longing, uh, eager waiting. All of creation, hear me, y'all. <laughs> All of creation is waiting for you to trust him. Why? Because what God spoke to you is an answer for someone else. Remix preached a message years ago. I must have been like 22 or something like that um, about your gift is not for you. When God birthed you, when he made you, when he, when he created you, you were an answer to a problem. God saw a problem in creation and he said, Yvette is the answer to that. Uh, and as soon as he thought that, Yvette was, right? He, he burst Yvette into the earth, okay? And she is now entered into earth to be the solution to problems, specifically a problem. Okay. In order for her to be the solution, she needs tools. She needs to be equipped. Okay. So every word God gives her through the course of her life is a tool to equip her to be the answer that she was birthed to be. So somewhere in creation, there is a problem that only Yvette can solve. Somewhere in creation, there's a problem that only Joan can solve. Now, that problem is waiting for Joan to run into it. However, Joan has to go through some stuff to gain equipment and sharpen her tools so that when she encounters the problem for which she was birthed, she is fully equipped and has the necessary expertise required to solve the problem. Every word God gives her in the course of her life, watch this, is so that it manifests part of her solution to the problem. When God prophesies something to you, gives a promise to you, it is so that you and I believe it to the degree that our faith causes it to manifest. Faith is the substance of what is hoped for. And so it is what comes about. And when it creates, watch this, it solves the problem that is in creation. The mountain that Caleb is given, uh, I think it's Horeb. Uh, I can't think of the name right now, somewhere to H. That mountain, you all, was designated as a city of refuge. City of refuge was the place where if somebody was falsely accused or even accused of a crime, in that day, it wasn't like a whole lot of court. Horror, thank you. It wasn't a lot of courts and all that stuff. So if you were accused of killing somebody's kid, that family could just kill you. Um, and so the, 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 the places of refuge were designated as places where a person could run to and have safety until justice could prevail, right? Caleb is not being given a mountain just so he can have 40 acres and a mule. He's not given a mountain just so he can be on your own TV cribs. He's not given this land just so he can be balling. He's given this land because he's going to govern the land in such a way that it is a place that those that are running for safety can be safe. He is an answer to a problem. Now, when God calls you and when God prophesies you something, everything in that goes to the solution for which you were created. So all of creation is waiting for you and I to believe him enough that our faith manifests what he's given us to solve a problem. So now there's a line in front of KFC. Line in front of KFC, everybody outside star, everybody home. Waiting for 
the, the manager to show up so he can open the door, open the building, so we can get our chicken heat. Waiting for this revelation, waiting for uh, to be revealed means to uh, lay bare, to to show something that was previously not seen. It is, it is manifesting something that was not previously there. Now, this is the interesting thing about um, manifestation when we talk about manifesting something it, it, or even revelation. It doesn't mean the thing didn't exist. It means now you just get to see that it always has. Um, many of you find yourself waiting. Not you, many of us find ourselves waiting, waiting on God to do X, Y, and Z, waiting on God to do what he promised. But some of the issue has been that when God spoke something, we did not pray into it. We did not pray over it. We did not fast over it. We did not uh, war against every attack of the enemy against it. We did not fight the crows and the birds away. We did not fight the enemy off of it. We just let it sit there. And the reason that is a problem is because when you let it sit there, you begin, we begin to lean our mind more into what we see. And we begin to take note of how long it's taking for this thing to not be. <laughs> and then what happens is when you're starting to look at it, you're like, man, this thing ain't growing. This thing ain't moving. Ain't nothing happening here. Uh, doubt creeps in. When doubt creeps in, doubt causes you and I, watch this, to begin to withdraw our hope for the thing. Now, hope, you all, is almost like spiritual watering, right? Uh, faith is the substance of what is hoped for. We are hoping for something. The Bible says, Paul said, uh, and hope in him, we go through it, tribulations, work at the experience, and experience uh, work at tribulation, and, and tribulation hope, and hope making not a shame. When you hope for something unwavering, it feeds the faith. And when it feeds our faith, our faith leans in to what God says. When we lean into what God says, we cover it. We war over it. We wrestle for it. We contend for that faith, right? We make sure that this thing is covered and that fights the enemy, enemy off. But when we do not do that and we lose hope in what he said, we back up off of it and our attention begins to fall upon the things that are already around us. The insanity of God's brilliance when making us similar to him is that we have this creative power. We have a creative power that anything, you know, mom and them say when you're growing up, anything you put your mind to, you can do. And while that's limited in some ways, because you can't sing, you can't sing, but you can take singing lessons, right? It is very much true. If, if man leans his heart to something, he can pull it off. Think about the Tower of Babel when humanity and our foolishness said we was going to build a tower to God. God says, we need to stop this because these fools <laughs> have to pull this off, right? Because we're so much like him, we have a creative power similar to him. So that if you lean on something, you focus in on something, you decide, you set your mind to something and you begin to declare that something, watch this, that begins to manifest. Creation backs up the words of those that are belonging to the Lord because he is creator. When Jesus curses the fig tree, he don't have to go into fasting and prayer. He curses it the next day is dead because creation responds to the voice of creator. So when we begin to speak and declare according to his word and his will, creation has to back up what we are saying as we say it in faith. This is why faith causes things to manifest. Well, this is why faith is the substance because creation begins to move around it. This is such a universal law that God has created is that even heathens think they doing something sometimes and they say stupid stuff like, oh, the universe and you speak it to the universe. That ain't the universe. <laughs> creation has a tendency to yield to the voice of God's uh, children, right? So when you and I begin to waver, Watch this. Creation wavers with us. So when we 
take our eyes, our ears, our hearts off of what he has declared. And we begin to lean back to the, the natural fleshly facilities that we have. We are a, how can I put it? We are a, not a Xerox machine, but I don't know how many of y'all heard of this. It's kind of new technology in the last 10, 15 years. They make these things called 3D printers, right? And so growing up for me, so I know for most of y'all growing up, uh, we had Xerox machines where you put something in and it copied it, but it was two dimensional. It was always just the paper, right? Uh, the 3D, the 3D uh, copiers, machines, what they do is you can print any three dimensional object. They print stuff like they've printed a car before. They've, and it's functional, it works. They've printed parts for cars, they printed guns. You can print a three dimensional functioning object, right? We are these machines. And so whatever we begin to look into, lean into, listen to, hear to, and that's where our heart is, that's what we replicate. That's what we produce. That's what we make. And so many of us are living, <laughs> we are living in the sufferings of now because we have not leaned to the future glory so much so that parts of that future glory manifest in our now to shield us from the sufferings of now. Uh, I can't say that again, so just listen to it again. So many of our struggles are not that God just wants us to perpetually suffer. It is because we have yet to trust him in such a way that our perception pushes us to the places where we see what has not yet been revealed, so much so that earth produces it in our present suffering. And it produces it in such a way that we see what others can't see. Woo! Uh, that's why he said the boy had a different spirit. He saw what the rest of them jokers could not see. And when you see what everybody else can't see, you come back with a different report. When you see what everybody else can't see, you come back with a different mindset. When you see what everyone else can't see, you shout when don't nobody else shout. You worship when don't nobody else worship. You suffer and struggle, watch this, with joy. You have to, you have to, Paul wrote a whole bunch of his writings in jail. You know how much you got to be seeing something ain't nobody else seeing in order to write about freedom while being locked up? You know how much you got to see what ain't nobody else seeing to, 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 to shout and to give God praise when it don't feel like it? You know how much you have to see what God is showing that has not yet shown up in the earth realm but you see it so much in your spirit that you that you can feel it, you can yearn for it. It's, it's like um, uh, oh, I get I get this. What time is it? Oh, it's time. It's time to go. I get this. Uh, when I was growing up, I think yeah, microwave came out when I was. I don't know how old I was. Microwave came out when I was little though, and my mama didn't know what a microwave was. No clue what a microwave was. None whatsoever. So she didn't want a microwave. She didn't, she, didn't, she didn't know what it was. She didn't know the thing existed. Why does she want something she don't know existed? Until my father made a comment about a microwave. He, my mother had been seeing the commercials, but she, she didn't know what the thing was. And my father, being more a tech person than my mom, he sees it. and He's like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, uh, Laverne might like that. That's my mom's name. And so he, he mentions it to her, right? Now, he's mentioned this microwave to her because she has heard it from the voice of my father. She has not seen it yet. But because he said something, it's now in her mind. So now she's looking for it because I want to see what this thing is that my husband is talking about. She heard him say something. She heard him say something and she heard him say something and it, and it clicked something in her mind. So now she's desiring something she's yet to see. She's only heard about from a trusted voice. So then the commercial comes on, turns out she's seen this commercial before. She never noticed it because she didn't have a word. <laughs> and now she sees again what she'd already seen but now she sees it with new eyes and now she's desiring something that a day before she didn't even know existed and now because she desires it watch this my father 
got her one for Christmas. Stay with me, y'all. I can't, I can't go through the whole thing. Uh, but she ended up getting something she desired from the person who put the desire in her because they knew it existed when she did it. My God in heaven, when God has spoken something to you, it is strictly to put a desire in you, to want him to reveal what he already has made for you. It's, he wants you to want what is yours. Because if you don't want what is yours, when it comes, you won't use it. If you don't want what is yours, when it comes, you won't maintain it. Faith is the substance of the hope. And it is proof of the unseen. It is proof of the unseen because there has to be a God somewhere, Caleb, working through the 40 years. <laughs> there is proof that is some unseen power operating behind the scenes in order for me to be as strong today as I was 40 years ago. There is proof. So how then do you decide and get the energy that after 40 years of waiting, I'm still about to ready to fight? I'm ready to fight because I have 40 years of proof. <laughs> I'm ready to fight because I have 40 years of proof. I have 40 years of hope. I have 40 years of wanting what I was said, what God said he wanted me to want. So why, if you've been working behind the scenes 40 years, would you not be with me for this next fight? Especially when what you want me to want is actually a solution to a problem in your creation that you called me to fix. I, I wanna leave you out with this. I wanna leave you out with this. I know what it looks like, but as much as is possible, ignore what you see. Stop taking inventory with your natural senses. Your natural senses will have you waiting for titles from men that have nothing to do with your call. Your natural senses will have you waiting for your neighbors to acknowledge your house and who cares, that's not why God gave it to you. Your natural senses will have you looking at doctor's reports day in and day out. Your natural senses will have you looking over the bills over and over and over and over. Don't none of that produce nothing that changes any of that. What changes all of that is when we reckon from the standpoint of faith. Uh, and so that's it. I, I, I want I want to make sure y'all can go watch TV and eat and live life. So uh, any any well, let me let's pray, and then if you have questions, we can answer questions real quick. Father, we bless you, God. We glorify you. We thank you for these your sons and daughters. We thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you for the fact that you respond to our faith. We thank you that you have called us for a purpose and you put us in this earth to solve a, solve something. And so, God, we yield to you. Life is hard sometimes, Lord. You know that. We thank you that we don't have a high priest that doesn't understand our sufferings and our struggles. But, God, we thank you that in spite of sometimes wavering, in spite of sometimes us floundering, uh, that you have been faithful to us. So now, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, that you would stir our faith that we, God, can hold fast to what you said, war for what you said, fight for what you said, fast for what you said, but trust in you that said it. We glorify you now. We thank you for your promises, for your, prophet, for your prophetic word to us. God, we trust that you will bring it to pass. For your glory, in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. All right, any questions, y'all?